Good evening and welcome. I am a one-room school that was located in section 16 of Darien Township in northern Leeser County, Minnesota. The land that I was built on in 1886 was deeded to the school district 107. Edward and Elizabeth Holler owned the farm where I was located, so I was referred to as the Holler School. Many children were taught inside of me, and many teachers taught at this school and many other schools throughout the county. Children from the local area went to school here until 1959, when my district was closed and consolidated to New Prague and other towns nearby. After my precious children left, I was used as a 4-H meeting place and mostly just an empty building after that. I was moved to Pioneer Power Showgrounds in 1986. That makes me 125 years old now. I believe that this will be my new and permanent home. The Burns girls, Lonnie and Diane, are the caretakers and curators of this building that I occupy. They clean, do windows, and tidy up the grounds before the Pioneer Power Show. Please plan to visit and hear some of the stories and how these treasured learning places helped many children during a simpler time. Thank you. Hi, welcome to School 107, the Holleran Schoolhouse. I'm Jeanette Holleran Nash, and I'm Dan Callahan. I uh, started school here in 1953, and I left, didn't really graduate, when the school consolidated in 1959. I was here for six years, of course, and I was only one of my class for all six years, a rather private teaching. And I attended for two years. So this is a picture of our last year here. That's myself. I was in second grade. And there's Dan. He was in sixth grade. And the year was 1959. Here's my brother Bob, Dan's sister Jan, Dan's sister Judy, and my sister Joan. The last class, 1959. Our teacher was Mary Elizabeth Keel for the whole time we were there. She was a single lady and taught many years before in other parts of the state. Uh, she was from Cordova, Kilkenny, and she lived with her brother and mother. She had a brother next door that farmed, it would be Jim and Esther Keel, and they helped out quite a bit with the school productions and cleaning and fixing and everything. So come on in. Our, this school was moved here in uh, 1989, and it moved to this spot. It was about six or seven miles away, east of here, on Denny Holleran's farm. That's where it was placed initially, well over 100 years ago. There were probably about 82 school districts, many of them country schools, many of them were log schools, and many, many of them had teachers that were from the local area, and some of them were students that actually went to that school in younger years. So they lived nearby. If they weren't, they boarded with a farmer or somebody that was in the school district, and that's just the way it was. It was just teachers teaching kids fundamentals and basics. It was a good time, very private education. So this is pretty much what it looked like when we went to school some of our last days. There's some add, a few added curls on the side. But we sat in the rolls of desks just like this. The teacher sat out in the front, and that's where she sat. That was her desk. Yeah. Probably the original desk, too. I think so. Uh, you were placed in the, as you can see, the desks are moving up as you moved up in the grades. And you were introduced to the school probably when you were five years old. You either went with a sibling 
uh, someone that went, brother or sister, or one of the neighbors took you in. We all knew each other. We all went to church at St. Thomas. We all belonged to the 4-H. So we, we were together a lot and we were neighbors. So we knew and understood one another and we were friends to begin with. So they just moved you along and she taught everybody, individual for the grades. Uh, you know, first grade got specialized instruction. Discipline was stressed. Patri patriotism was stressed. Every day we said the Pledge of Allegiance. And every day we had little chores to do. We respected our teacher. She taught us well, even though sometimes some of us didn't think we were getting it, but we were. We really were. And, and we, we found that out later in life. We learned, like, geez, I guess I learned that in school. So that was, uh, that was how day to day went. So in the back, you might notice there's a, a stool. This, this was not there when we went. I went to school. We had, I think, an oil stool or something. Yeah. But this would have been what it might have looked like in the earlier days. And then we had our library back here with many of the original books, more over here, with uh, what many might have looked like. Um, that is not the, that may have been an original cooler in the earlier days. Um, Danny, I think you were talking about how we that water out here. We live next to a woods, and a creek ran right by the school. Now it's called a county ditch, of course. But we used to haul water. The bubbler sat right here, and it was a big croc, red wing croc, that's probably very much valued today as an antique. And it sat on a stand. And underneath was a pail that caught the water that came out. There was a little cup, and you pressed it and drank or had a cup. Every day, and in my case, me and Bob Hollerin would go get water up at Denny Hollerin's. Sometimes we'd have to take the road, but if the creek was dry, we got the shortcut to go up there and get the pail. And I called it the long pail water haulers because Bob was taller, but the doggone pail would reached down on the floor ground when I was trying to haul it. And Denny would check off. Every time we got a pail of water and we went up, he'd check it off. And that gave us a nickel. So at the end of the month, there was competition to who could get the most nickels from Denny. So that was just part of our daily chore. We, we all went to school early in the morning. We started at 8, got the water, cleaned up whatever. Mary Keogh got the stove started. Sometimes it wouldn't start right away, but there was always a neighbor to help. And we'd kind of walk around and jog in place just to warm up in the wintertime. But then we got into the school day. One of the things that I remember that I never caught on to was the penmanship. We had the Palmer method. I mean, you had to be in the lines. You had to be perfect curves and everything. Now it's called cursive, and nobody does it anymore. They just type. But there was electricity there was no running water, there were no computers, no anything at all that we used. We just had electricity to light the place up, but it was before TV. Most of us ended up getting television around 1955, and we ended up with two or three stations. So we were very limited in the knowledge we had. We were very close-knit. We didn't go very far. We went to school. And then there were chores at home. The end of the school day, we had to help the teacher clean up. We had to help sweep the floor. We clapped the erasers. Uh, some of the children don't understand what that is because it's dry mark, whatever now. We used to clap the dust out of the erasers, the chalk dust, because everything was done on the chalkboard that you see in front. Everything was done, a lot of instruction, a lot of our books. So it was a good life, and like I say, you, it was very enriching, very much hands-on with the teacher. Jeanette, talk about the outhouses. Didn't have COVID. No, 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 no. There's nobody. They were two. They're off to each side. So when you needed to use the bathroom, no matter what the weather, uh, I remember it out there was the girls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the boys was out there. It was the outhouse. That was it. it. It wasn't like a porta potty is today. 
it was an outhouse. And you can look it up online, those of you that want to. It was very cold in the wintertime. I mean, frostbite if you stayed too long, okay? The other thing was the toilet paper was some kind of government issue. It was kind of like thin wax paper, and it was difficult. And a lot of people might have used something like this. A catalog was probably more tender on your bottom. And that's kind of how it was we did it. Some of us had that at home, so we were used to that. And it was later on, after we got the television, that we ended up getting indoor plumbing. I remember that, too. Oh, yeah. That's the way we grew up. We had to go outside at home to our outhouse, so yeah. it was no big deal. Yeah. None of it was. I mean, there were Retkas, there were Pionks, there were Meggers, there were Sullivans. And you could see it in the books. You could see the name or some of the writings on a desk, God forbid. But you knew some of these people. Some of them babysat you, but they went to this school too. So it had a long, long history and, and a legacy of good education all the way through. Many, many young women, mainly in this school, taught here. They were local. They were from the area. So they understood the people. They understood the culture coming in. And they knew what we were kind of like. So they kind of blended in and taught what we wanted to learn. And, uh, and they knew what we wanted to learn. They knew our folks. Some of them grew up with our folks. So they, they knew everybody around. It was, it was a very, very sweet deal. So what games do we play, Jeanette? Pum, pum, pum. Pum, pum, pull away and Annie over. Probably tag. And yeah. I know we had a, a little swing set yep. and a slide out in the front. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a big thing, but... Um, it was enough for recess. We probably played some ball games. Um, yeah, we we did we did have re recreation, though it might not have been organized. We did play softball. We had difficulty fielding a team. I remember when my brother was there, there were 12 kids. It was all right. We kind of had teams. But the last couple of years, with five kids, and some of them pretty little, we didn't really field the team. We played the regular games they played back then, pump, pump, pull away, ante, ante, over, kickball, uh, things of that nature. And we had a swing set. Wintertime, we played in the snow. We built snow forts and all that stuff and had little fun out there and we played outside most of the time unless the weather was real bad were they organized not really but we were outside doing something staying active staying with it and when the teacher would ring the bell we'd come inside dutifully we'd come in sit down warm up and go back and do our thing so there was and there was some sports like i said but what it was was we had some indoor things if the weather was bad or too cold we had old records one that comes to mind is grandmother once had a little gray goat kid and the other one was shrimp boats are a coming all these things that mary keogh had archived from when she was teaching in hibbing i believe earlier times so we had these things and we kind of did it one of the things i wanted to mention was we had a woods right next door no we didn't have a living lab but we had a woods and if we needed to go on a nature walk or to experience the woods and what was in there no problem shut school down for a half a day go to the woods try and keep out of the bad nettles and poison ivy pick leaves find insects do whatever we could do and that was that was a wonderful time it was a learning time even though like i mentioned before it was kind of subliminally but we learned nonetheless we're all farm kids so we knew all about farm agriculture and all that stuff and we all had a help on the farm but it was good that we had neighbors to help, not only to fix things, but to keep the school going. And one of them was Denny Hollering up the road. Some of the other neighbors had come in. And I want to highlight Jim and Esther Keogh. That was uh, Miss Keogh's brother, Jim. And he would do stuff all the time. And one winter in particular, I was pretty young, it was before Jeanette came to school. The teacher decided to give us 
to read a Christmas carol. Well, again, we didn't know what was happening. So we read the Christmas carol, and everybody kind of understood, and we talked about it on and off for a week. Well, lo and behold, here we are. We're getting ready to put on a play. Jim Keogh came in and built a stage right in the front. Build it up about maybe uh, eight, ten inches. They hung wire and they put a curtain up there, uh, sheets. They had a backstage so we could change. And we had 12, 13 kids going, so we put on a Christmas carol. And of course, I was the little guy, kind of mouthy, but I was a little guy. And I was Tiny Tim laying under a sheet, and I had limited lines because I was so young and shy, yeah. But I, I remember sitting up in the bed and saying my lines, and God, I remembered my lines. And I could look in the back, and the whole school was full. And I could see people standing up, and my brother's best friend was Dennis Sharkey. And I could see Denny's smiling face, because he always had that grin on for some reason. And I could see him in the back, and I knew that it was okay. And it was a good night for everybody, but that was a big production with a lot of work with a lot of people helping. It was wonderful and a great learning experience. I don't think I've read Dickens since, but it was a good learning experience nonetheless. And that lunch pit. <laughs> and I'm thinking about oh, that's... how, you know, we didn't have warm food come in, to, in for at lunch times. We'd have to always bring our own lunches and we'd, we'd have milk brought in by the milkman. The milkman also sometimes served as our bus from the Hollerans coming to school. We'd hitch a ride on the, with the milkman and he'd drop us off at school and also drop off the milk for our lunches. I, I went into third grade. Third grade. So when, I, when this closed down, my next year was the old elementary school in the grade. And I went into third grade. Clara River. Can you can you talk about that transition, the advantages and the disadvantages, and what, what you remember, what impressed you, what excited you? Well, I guess uh, transitioning from being the only student in your class, in second grade, and my my teacher, you know, that I told you she doesn't even need to go into third grade. Let's just push her out of the fourth grade already. But we went into third grade and 30 students in the class as compared to five that were here. It was, it was an adjustment. But uh, in the same day, there were other there. And I remember one girl that came up with her friends because her school was also one that had closed. So she had come from a country school and come into New Grade and was part of the, my new class. Uh, so it, it took a little transition of uh, seeing so many students having lunch in the I'm okay. school and having lunches. So. Big playgrounds and uh, riding a bus. So that was our first experiences. Uh, and we had a long, I think it was almost an hour on the bus because we were one of the first ones and we had to go. I think we even picked up the Callahan. Yeah, bus. yeah, we, we did. We went out in this area. So uh, quite an adjustment. Mine was different. And you were going then into seventh grade, weren't you? My uh, transition was quite different because I spent six years pretty much by myself. And on the farm, I was pretty much by myself. I'd rather stay home and take care of the animals and go anywhere because sometimes I didn't quite fit in or get along. So when I went after six years, it was a difficult transition. In the first place, all the numbers of kids and people ganging up in the playground, I wasn't used to that because I was used to doing my own thing with Bob. No big deal. Plus, I was a fair-haired kid with pink skin and freckles, so I didn't really fit in with everybody there either. And um, there was a lot of, it wasn't really hazing, just, just getting picked on, but I came through it okay because I was a little more verbal than I should have been. 
but I, I seemed to get along after a while and, and then it was all right. But the first year was uh, pretty difficult going from sixth grade to seventh grade was uh, a tough time for me got used to it and then just grew with it and did my thing after that but Jeanette's right the bus ride was long uh, some of the kids misbehaved so when we first got there from country school we just sat down we were kind of scared and we were quiet and we put up with the rabble rousing and whatever else went on and uh, and just wrote it out uh, when Jeanette mentioned the milk we didn't ride with the milkman because he was going the other <laughs> other way so he went down towards Blakely after us but he wasn't always on time but that's another story for another day but I'm going to mention a little bit about Jimmy Keel again and what great people they were with the 4-H and Jimmy started a ball team actually town and country which we were all in involved in and there's another side story I'll talk about someday we had what we called cow pie stadium because it was a pasture and it had to be cleaned off every day before we had practice and before we had a ball game very interesting but some of us kids from that school were actually there either playing ball or trying to play ball I'd like to get your impression of the London schoolhouse and um, you kind of put yourself in a different time and place. And do you think that you would have liked to have gone to one room school being the only kid in your grade? Or? That would have been a very hard day. I probably wouldn't have they're honest. Well, you're helping you, and you're the older students would have helped you too. Sometimes they tutored and helped the teacher read the books and the stories to you and, and help you to progress. Or going, maybe you've got your your boots on and you're ready to go home or uh, kind of guided the younger kids uh, during the school day. How about the uh, question? It's definitely different from like what we're used to, but I think it would have been it would have been different, but I think it would have been fun. Do you think that going to a one room schoolhouse as your grandmother and a kid kind of encouraged you maybe to want to be a teacher because it was a it was a safe and kind of a welcoming and a, an environment uh, where you could help others? I think, I think so. Mm -hmm. What, what, what are your impressions of the women's school calls? Um, what's been cool? I mean, to have it be teached back then, taught back then, mm -hmm. here, before. So that was like... Yeah. What about you did in the outhouse in the middle of winter when you had to run outside? I think that would have never done that. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. no. So you might have to get a piece of skin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And what about uh, these desks? What do you think about these desks? They're a little different than your school desks. I kind of like them a little better because then you kind of have your own little square. Yeah. Uh -huh. But you don't have like a. I don't, do you have a sign desk? Oh, I'm sure. Okay. They're confining. Did they have a sign seating over the store? Did you I know? imagine there was. Mm -hmm. Mostly look for the one that fit. Yeah. <laughs> Because you didn't want that real little one, you know, or the first big one in the back. But you, you kind of sized them all first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we talked about the, the hole in the desk, and originally, when, before ballpoint pens, they had ink, there were ink bottles there. What was that story that I told you about? Um, the your, well, it was, I think it was your dad. Um, he took the back of of uh, a girl's ponytail and he was in front of her him. Um, he took his he ponytail from her and he dipped it in a ponytail thread. Um, he dipped it in that ink bottle. What kind of dirty tricks? Do you remember any dirty tricks that were played at? Well, we, we transitioned to fountain pens, and you could squirt with them once in a while and get somebody's blouse kind of messed up. Yeah. We didn't do it too much, but uh, the younger Sharky boy, Dennis Sharky, could tell you stories all about that because he probably did it. But there, there was an, and, and we were, we didn't have ink wells per se, but we had fountain pens that we drew the ink out of and used them and there, there was stuff like that. And of course there were the usual spitballs and then we'd, we'd bring in, what we had was a goose quill 
and you could you could make a potato shooter out of it. And we were into that. And you could fix it so you could plug a potato on one end, and then you had a little stick made out of an old orange crate, and you could shove that, and you could pop a potato thing, and, and nobody would know. And then all of a sudden, they'd get hit by it. And little things like that we did, but they were using your head. The teacher kind of allowed it, but confiscated them as soon as she saw it. So yeah, we did little tricks like that. I mean, that's what kids do. That's right, guys? The boys. Yeah. Now, Mrs. Dash, you, you became a teacher, would you? Now, if you were to watch teaching in this kind of a fun environment for children of different ages. I think I would have. I think it was a smaller class. I think we had. I look at some of the pictures of these huge classes, you know, that all went to school here. It was different, but it was uh, a good way to really let each student excel, I think, because they could help each other, mm -hmm. and you could zero in on one student and make sure they, they got what they did. So. The best thing was the teacher knew you, and after being there six years, she understood how I thought. And a lot of times in today's education, there's just not enough time. You deal with them for one hour a day. Maybe they misbehaved yesterday. Maybe there's something going on in their family you don't know about. But the teacher knew what was going on inside of you. So she geared it to that. And somehow, like I say, they got you to learn, even though you might have been fighting it and not understanding it, you did learn. And it was very individualized, very personal, and you had a lot of pride in your work. You knew you had to do good, you knew you had to complete it and get it done on time. That was, that was a big thing with our teacher. She was very good. She was inspirational, and she did a lot of good for a lot of kids for the time she was there. I, I realize that now. And um, one last, one of the last things I thought you did have a dress code when you came to school. You, were you, were there things you could not wear or were discouraged from wearing, or how would you, in today's style of fashion? No. Well, uh, you didn't have probably a huge wardrobe anyway. <laughs> so it, it was, you know, you wore better clothes, but it wasn't. There was no address code or anything. No. And getting back to uh, teaching students, too, I, I was thinking, as far as discipline, well, the, you knew the students and you knew the parents. The parents and the teacher could communicate, and whatever problems arose would quickly be no okay. problem later on <laughs> because the parents would make sure. That as well. So there was a, a good line of communication going on. The clothing was pretty much standard. I mean, we all dressed pretty much the same. And it was a big trip to go to Hans in Belle Plaine. That's where we went and we bought school clothes. You got your pair of jeans, you got your flannel shirt, you got your work shoes that you wore in the barn too and you wore them to school. And it was pretty much the same for everybody. We all dressed the same, did the same thing. So there, there, was, you know, there was no competition. That's just the way it was. You can see that the boys are wearing the jeans, the girls are wearing dresses. Pretty much, I guess, we wore dresses unless it was sort of a uh, picnic time or something. Or you could wear push-ups or pull pedal pushers. Pedal push. We did go on, uh, the school didn't really go on any picnics or anything like that, but I remember the one time we went up to a park in St. Paul with the Hollands, and we, we had a picnic up there, and I think then we went over to Como Park, and uh, Bob and I kind of got lost just walking around, but uh, it was a big thing for us. I mean, farm families just did their work. They didn't get together too much unless they were related, and this was a big thing. We planned the picnic, we went, the two families went, all the kids, even the younger ones still at home, and that was a good time, but we didn't do that often. Probably not often enough. So what was the, what was the field trip? 
Or I don't really remember a field trip, but it, like I said, I didn't even go there that long, but I don't remember going on any field trips. We go to the woods. Yeah. It was, I remember um, looking at the pictures of um, picnics. Mm -hmm. Big picnics. I mean, all the, all the grades were together and mm -hmm. the schools were together. Mm -hmm. I just, just Tell, tell the children who you are. Oh, I'm Lonnie Graham. I'm the caretaker of this place. Thank you. What a story. No, I played with pigs in here. <laughs> <laughs> she's, yeah, she's, got, she's got a lot of history on this. My thing. grandma started here when she was four years old. Um, uh, Ed Holland was at a meeting and um, when the school first started, the first built, and he went home from the meeting and he said to his um, daughter and his wife, Alice, you're going to school. She was four. And um, she started school. There had to be um, 20 students to start a school. And there was 19. And with Alice Holland, she made the 20th one. So they were able to start the school. And that's an 18, 90, Six, I'm thinking. Um, what else? Well, it's interesting. The history of the schoolhouse is very rich. I have some uh, carvings I'd like to show you outside. Now, uh, it's it, it was moved to this site. It was moved to this site, and it's on the Pioneer Power site, which mm -hmm. Pioneer Power maintains it. Here's the school. An etching. Yes, it stood. Outside, mm -hmm. that's like it's B H, and there were only three windows oh, wow. on each side when the mm -hmm. school was first Our built. No, but they did it. Our, but the fifty students are right here. Yep. Oh. Look, the tack like sardines. Was Alice the oldest? On that Alice, band? no, name was. Okay. My grandma was um, the oldest at the main. But there was, yeah, there was 11 kids mm -hmm. in the Halloran family. 11 or 12. Yeah, I think there was a dozen, but, and then the mother was a Shea. And the mother was a Shea. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So he, the school, one of the schoolhouses evolved in neighborhoods, so to speak, like public schools in Minneapolis did. So you went to the school that was closest to where you, where your home was. But in this particular case, the distances were probably no more than two miles from the one of the schoolhouse. So because children had to walk and access the, the school they, on their own, they had to have a clear and easy path to get there and to get home again. Do you remember some of the storms uh, during the school year that caused problems? Oh yeah, we used to have snowdrifts that would be up to the windows. And I can remember tunneling and all the stuff that we used to do. And if we couldn't get out of the driveway, it wouldn't go. And you think about the teacher, she drove from Kilkenny, to Cordoba all the way up. The one thing I wanted to mention about the schools, as I mentioned early on, there were like 82, and a lot of them were rural districts. And there was one at St. Thomas, there was one just down this road called the, the Hayden School, even though it wasn't on Hayden property, but a lot of Hayden boys went there. There was a Sharkey School north, close to Highway 19, where my grandmother taught. And everyone picked up the name of the landowner that either donated the land or the land it was on. Like this is a Holleran School, the Sharkey School. There was a school at Clear Lake at Lexington. So like Dennis mentioned, they were about every three or four miles and uh, you just went to the school that was closest and, and, and learned there, but they were all neighbors. Uh, the buses started coming. 
uh, you know, when I was in grade school, but we stayed with the school we were at. Uh, some of the kids went, but the bus routes weren't formed yet. They, they kind of were willy-nilly in here and there. So later on, the bus routes got more, more people on them and, and more routes that they did. So then we all went. And once they were consolidated in 59, I think we were one of the last schools to consolidate, we, um, we had to go on the bus and leave the drive to us. The uh, putty, and it, our EH, and I thought that was maybe um, Robert Emmett Holler. And Jeanette says, could have been my brother, Robert Edward Holler. But we think it probably was the Longer, first yeah. one. I don't think Robert had that much naughtiness in him. Yeah. Emmett did. Yeah. <laughs> um, Dennis on that stick. The Woodland Schoolhouse is a kind of an iconic uh, experience for many American children that are older than 60 years old. Today there are no Woodland Schoolhouses except maybe one in Isle, in the, way up in the northwest corner of Minnesota, accessed only by boat or by snowmobile. It, Butts against the Canadian border on Lake of the Woods. Other than that, the one home schoolhouses disappeared probably in the later 1950s, or early 1960s. Surprisingly, they still continued at that time. This project is a culmination of an interest that I had in telling the story of one room schoolhouses and identifying where they were in the townships surrounding New Prague. I'm associated with the New Prague Area Historical Society, and an exhibit at the Memorial Library in New Craig identifies where these Wendland schoolhouses were in the surrounding townships, as well as artifacts that were commonly found in the Wendland schoolhouse. The stories are very similar from one student to another that attended the Wendland schoolhouses. They walked to school, the older students tutored, the teacher oftentimes boarded at their home. They carried their lunch to school, which was not fancy. Uh, oftentimes it was a lard sandwich and maybe a cookie or a piece of fruit, but not always. Anything that could have fit in a can that you saw earlier when we left the, the room. The teachers were dedicated they had written into their teacher contract, they had to clean the school. They taught basically from 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock, but their school day did not end, of course. And they taught from May, or from, excuse me, from September through May, with time off when children could not attend because there was harvesting at home or farm-related issues or when winter storms prevented them attending school. So it varied. One of the things that I found out that was interesting, and my last point, was how difficult students had when they did not speak English at home. Surrounding the Prague were Bohemian families and German families. And often that their native language was only spoken at home. So when they got to school, they had to assimilate, and English was the fastest way for them to learn and to feel part of the American experience. Uh, being bilingual is great, but when you do not have English as the, the foundation of your school being at home, it made it, made it difficult. Um, did, you, in, uh, did you find, Dan, that attending a London schoolhouse changed your life in any way? It was a very uh, good time. It was innocent, as most of us were. We weren't really aware of the world around us. Uh, we weren't, we didn't have television. We didn't have the computer. We didn't have a lot of access. And our 
parents rarely talked about politics, maybe around election time, or if somebody came to the house, as they used to say, electioneering, we, uh, we just didn't. So it, it was a good time, and it, it kind of set the foundation and gave you good values that stayed with you for the rest of your life. There was very little in between. It was either right or wrong, and especially with the teachers. And as Jeanette Power and Nash so rightly put it, they knew with the parents, they knew what the parents were doing with the child, and if there were problems, there was communication. It was direct. It was truthful. Nobody was afraid of telling the truth or expressing themselves. So that part I grew up with. And also there was a very distinct, strong patriotic and moral code that we all pretty much live by. Some may have strayed later, depending on their experience, where they were, what they did. But it was uh, it was good. And I think it helped shape the fact that I can get along on my own. I don't necessarily need a group. I can function with a group. But I'm fine getting along on my own because that's the way it was for seven, eight years, you know, by the time I was 12, 13 years old. And even in school, when I transitioned to public school, the big school in town, um, the first year, it pretty much isolated because you, you were slow to make friends because you only had a few and you ended up doing things alone. That's pretty much it. But then after a while, that all blended in, but the rest of it stayed. I mean, the rest of it stayed. The memory stayed. And the foundation will always be there. Well, Nani, um, I want to thank you for being the custodian of this school and inviting us here today. What has been your greatest challenge in, in restoring the Dwemer Schoolhouse? And how is it received by the people who attend Pioneer Power and tour it? Um, Take care of the school has been a labor of love because my grandmother started here when she was um, I have uh, experienced a lot of good comments. People coming through here. Oh, Grandma has it. Grandma did that. You know, um, it's been rewarding. Did you attend the one-room school? I never did. I played with tapes in here. No. Uh, but was it used then as a, a, a farm? Yeah, a shed. A shed. For a few years, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Until it became a, a 4-H building? Yeah, yeah we, uh, we used it for 4-H meetings quite a bit. Like I mentioned, I, I came down in my early years in the FA before I got hired. I came down here to study. We have the solitude and person all the memories and the learning environment was there. I used a blackboard and everything, but it was it was open. It shouldn't have been, but the door was open. So we used the portage meetings. I think maybe a couple other meetings once in a while. But again, Jim and Esther Keeler were always there. All of them. Well, pigs are an intelligent mammal, <laughs> and and <laughs> like and like people, they're very sometimes very pig-headed. <laughs> so the, the, the relationship of Students and children and pigs is a is a, a great analogy and comparison. Um, I'd like to know where you see this building being used in the future. Is it used by is it used by schools? And the teachers can teachers tour the school and so on. Mm-hmm. Come from the store. This is the right? And Ashley's house here. Yeah, there's been classes like a second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and we still are coming up here just to see if it's there. What are what are, what comment stands out in your mind when people come through here or observe it? One of disbelief, one of oh gee, I wish so you know, the old days were here, you know, I miss the old days of Students today read Laura Ingle Wilder, Wilder's books where she taught in one room schoolhouse and attended them. Did they ever bring that comparison forward in their discussion? That they saw it on the loss of the prairie. Mm-hmm. Even my grandma came through here. Um, Dad had this 
you know, because Little House on the Prairie was a lot of it. A lot of it. But they had the double deaths. Little House on the Prairie. I've read just about everybody I'm going to speak to more than to me. But a lot of the people are my age and older, one to one in school, somewhere. In fact, one of the icons here, Lady Stika, she was Betty Benish. She taught at a country school, going on to be a teacher. Betty Benish. Oh, Betty, 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 oh, Betty was um, instrumental in having this here, Betty, Betty, Betty uh, Stika. Stika. But she was, right. she was a Benish, and, and they were they're like icons out here. I mean, Betty was all over the place, dressed in typical period costume. And everybody loved her. She just said that she taught at a one-room school. Then she transitioned into the other school. So the point I'm making, there are a lot of women, a lot of good women that taught school. And they had it in their heart. They wanted to help. They wanted to pass it on. They wanted to help the next generation. That's what it was all about. How come, how come men were not as common t- in t- teaching in women's schoolhouses? I know in earlier years they were, but where do you think that, you know, I, there are many men that are teachers in both in the elementary, middle, and high school, but it seemed to have missed, they kind of avoided teaching. These are country schools. Um, that's what I'm doing. I, I, think, I think that's just what women did because there weren't too many options for them at the time. A lot of men just stayed on the farm. I'll give you my father for example, and you might not like me saying this. He went to one of the school. He ended up going to the McKinnis School, which was north of where the original homestead was, in Scott County, two miles away. His mother taught at the Sharkey School across the county line before she was married. His mother didn't really like the teacher out there at the McKinnis. So she had open enrollment. She moved all her kids down to the Sharpie School. So that's where my dad taught. I taught her, but listen to him. Scratch that. That's where my dad went to school. And he met up with a lot of skill and some of them of, of the, the Polish neighborhood. So he got to know these guys. So he went there to eighth grade, and then he was supposed to go to high school in the grade, like his sister did. Graduated thirty-six, and Buddy was going to go there too. He walked into school, didn't like what he saw, walked out, came back home, went to work. And his dad supported it. His mother was furious because she was a teacher. And he said, "You didn't like school, did you, Buddy?" No. I said, "Well, that's okay. You can just stay in the park." And that's what he did. And a lot of them, a lot of them didn't go to secondary school because. A lot of the men did not do that. Very few of them went. And some of the women went to normal school for two years and they taught. And that's just how it was. Okay. Not right or wrong. It, it, and not that that was men's work or that was women's work. That's just the way things shook out because the men were expected to either stay home on a farm, go out get a job. The women were expected to get married or to school for a while and then go. Yeah, girls, uh, uh, like boys, generally didn't go beyond eighth grade. And they were old enough and tall enough and strong enough they could help at home, not only during the harvest season, but with younger siblings or neighbors' children or their, uh, their nieces and nephews. It was a very, very labor intensive period of time that, that, uh, during the time they were one in the schoolhouse. Well, I certainly appreciate you being part of our conversation and uh, any last minute thoughts that you'd like to mention and bring forward. I'm proud of this book. I'm you know, just here. And not just me anyway, but uh, yeah, I'm proud of this. I can tell. <laughs> anyway. I didn't know the level of involvement, honestly. Because I maybe passed through here and I was always working and maybe the burn stores were here. But their level of dedication and actually the curators of this place to me has kind of kicked up my interest in the school. And when I'm asked to talk about a meeting new siding or a new door, I'll pursue that. I'll speak to that 
others will, I hope, join in and say, hey, let's do this. I said to Diana, I says, you don't want to talk plants and stuff. I said, I do. I says, maybe we could find and get some plants around here. And she said, well, let's wait to see if we get excited first. And I said, fine. Fine with me. But to me, the level of dedication, not only of these two women, but of everybody out here is phenomenal. There's a lot of great people that put in a lot of time. And nobody expects one dime to pay. They're just here. All like fixing. The work goes on here to find your power starting all summer. But it comes to a head on Saturday last week. And people are here cleaning, fixing, getting stuff ready, painting. We have one guy, a plumber from uh, Bell Plain, Jimmy Lang. He's painting, he's painting all the time. We call him the fossil. He's painting everything. And he can be out here in the middle of the week. And it, to me, it's one of the, the better organizations around because people are dedicated. They care. The only problem I can see on the horizon, a lot of the people are my age or older, and I'm 75. So we're looking 10, 15 years down the road. We're going to have a great celebration this year, but an even better one on the 50th, which is next year. That's the 50th year. Well, congratulations, and remember that you can always bring your, your parents and your families and grandparents and friends to visit the Halloran Schoolhouse here on the grounds of Pioneer Power during Pioneer, Pioneer Days in August. Thank you, and... If you have any comments or questions, be sure you contact me. My name is Dennis DeVore from the New Area Historical Society, and I am in the telephone book. Mm-hmm.